Good afternoon, everyone, I mean, and good morning, depending on where you're tuning in from. I'm Rafael Espinal. I'm the Executive Director and President of Freelancers Union. It's a pleasure uh, to have you all tuned in today. Uh, we have a uh, few guests who are joining us to talk about, uh, one, uh, the topic on mutualism and the role freelancers can play, and the role Freelancers Union has played around making sure that we create a mutualist society supporting each other, uh, especially at a time uh, when we uh, look at government and not seeing the sort of relief that we need coming down the pipeline, how can we work together to ensure we're building our own social safety net uh, while government catches up uh, to our needs? Uh, and for that conversation, we have Sarah, Sarah Horowitz, uh, who will be joining us any second now. And after we speak to Sarah, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, our new majority leader, uh, will join us uh, to talk about uh, all of the uh, relief packages that, ha that have been in the works over the past few months, uh, the most recent conversations that have happened, and uh, potentially how they can work to ensure that freelancers moving forward are not being uh, hurt by any sort of policy that comes down the pike on a federal level. And we as an organization are very in tune uh, to those conversations. They're going to try all we can in our power to ensure that we're part of advocating for our members, but also freelancers, independent workers across the country. Uh, so before we get to that conversation, I really uh, want to uh, introduce Sarah Horowitz, who is the founder of Freelancers Union, a uh, close friend of mine. We've worked very closely over the years, especially around city policy to create the Freelancers in Free Act. I was the chair of consumer affairs in the New York City Council when she approached us about this idea of how government can play a role in ensuring that freelancers are getting paid on time, that they have the right to a contract, and the city of New York is playing a role in ensuring that their wages are not being stolen and they're getting paid on time. It was revolutionary at the moment. It still is. There are many cities that do not have this law in place. There are many countries that are, that are looking at it as a model, of, to my knowledge. So, Sarah, thank you for all of your great work, all of your hard work. And I know you're also, uh, you know, have your own exciting uh, venture. You, you just wrote, written a new book which you are releasing around mutualism, a very important topic, especially now through this pandemic. So thanks for joining us. Oh my God, it is, uh, it is a great pleasure. And I have to say the book comes out February 16th and this is the first event. So it feels really fitting that uh, I get to start with freelancers, which are um, you know, the people I, I believe in so much. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and really thanks you, to you too, Raphael, you know, everybody who's ever founded anything, the best joy is to watch something be led by somebody who is so committed and motivated and hardworking. So thank you uh, so much for the work you do. Well, thank you, Sarah. So before we get into your book, you know that we, we have a lot of members, over 500,000 people uh, have found value uh, on, on the work that you've done, the work that we're doing. Uh, we've built a very important community, you know, as you know, you know, independent workers are, are their fragmented workforce and the, the union has really played a role in bringing everyone together to kind of build a voice and make real change happen, but also kind of build a community in which we're supporting each other. Can you talk about, you know, your role in finding the organ, founding the organization? Uh, what was your idea behind it? What were your hopes? Are, are we there? Yeah, yeah. So um, if you'll forgive me for, for not answering it as if it were a soundbite and to say it like this. <laughs> You know, I come from a labor family, <clears throat> and so I, my grandmother lived in union housing on the Lower East Side. So unions were just the things that changed our lives in very basic ways, in the ways we li li lived our lives. And I went to the labor school at Cornell, so I had all these ideas of models. And then I was an independent worker myself and was misclassified. And so I started to say, what, what are, how are we going to do this? And I started to realize, just like what you were saying, freelancers are working everywhere. You have to find a way where they come to find each other <clears throat> to start to build some power, both economically and politically. And so it was really clear that we needed to start with something that people really needed, which was health insurance. And then people would tell their friends and we'd be able to start to build an organization as if we were at a factory, but instead we were virtually going to come together and then find the ways to specifically come together. And in building out that, it became clear to me that freelancers were defining a new way of working, a new politics, a new way of living. I came to call that mutualism 
which is a word that has been used for many, many decades, centuries. Uh, Proudhon started that in France, uh, in biology is mutualism. And so it's recognizing that where we are right now, we're having tremendous gaps in government. And what we have to do is start to self-organize in mutual aid, in unions and cooperatives and faith-based groups. And that freelancers union really was the start and continues to show that. Um, I'm just gonna run through quickly, Raphael, if it's okay with you, that there are three elements of what makes something mutualist. And I really think that freelancers union demonstrates that. So why don't we run through those three and then chat some more. So the first one is we need organizations that have a social purpose. And I don't just mean like do good in the world or a nice little charity. I mean, organize a community and say, what do you need freelancers? And it has to be boundaried by freelancers for freelancers. And the second element is it has to be able to pay for itself, but not again with some outside you know, donor money, but something that are services or subscriptions or dues. And the third is that it has to have a long-term view, something that really shows you that we can take this from generation to generation. And when you look at it, that whole sector is the mutualist sector and it's unions, cooperatives, mutual aid and faith communities. And Freelancers Union really is the leader of, I think the labor groups that are demonstrating that in those three elements. Got it. Yeah, super interesting. And, you know, I, I, I know, you know, as we both know, there, there's a lot of conversations. Is Freelancers Union a real union, right? No, we're not part of the AFL-CIO. We are not part of that traditional model. It was a new model you created in hopes of bringing uh, freelancers together so that we can work together and build a stronger social safety net together. Uh, and you've, you've proved to, proven to do that with the, you know, with the health insurance models. Uh, most recently, we as an organization created the Freelancers Relief Fund fundraising for our, from our membership to ensure that other members who needed support were getting that support. Um, so, you know, I, I just want to really want to reiterate the importance of that, of coming together, organizing, making real change happening, doing it that way. So, uh, to, in, in, I guess, in your opinion, like, why, why do you feel now more than ever this is important? Yeah, so, you know, it's funny. I think we have to say something and underline it three times. This is not something that people need to get together and solve their problems without government. That's never gonna work. Really what we need is a very active government that sees it as its job to build out this mutualist sector. And it's not a new idea. FDR, when he was thinking about how to build out the New Deal, he said, hey, there's this great thing called unions. Unions are boundary by a community of workers. They have an economic mechanism called dues and they have a structure that can go from generation to generation. So he didn't create like government unions and he didn't say, let's just make them private sector do-gooder organizations. He said, no, no, they need to be a social sector and they're gonna deliver the safety net. And we're in exactly that same moment. President Biden has a really important agenda ahead of him. And the only way that that will get not just done and passed, but implemented and made so that there's a powerful constituency behind it is if unions, cooperatives, mutual aid groups, and faith-based groups can start to deliver the safety net, like the freelancers union. The freelancers union shows that it has the infrastructure, it has the mission, and can start delivering training and benefits as it already does. That way we can start to really give these groups a job and show how in society, it's not like these cute one-offs that have to be foundation funded. This is the job of government. And this is a society where our economy is distributed, it's decentralized. So you have to get to the hyper grassroots groups and you have to start trusting these communities again to have decision-making. And I think that's the most important thing like when I look at what's happening in our discourse and the way we talk to each other, we've lost trust and faith in one another. And when you're in an organization where you have to be with people you don't agree with, you feel rooted. You can have your fights, but you can find the things that will make it so that the economy gets to be fairer. And we can require growth in each other. 
Um, and so I think these institutions, they teach us how to do that. They always have and they always will. So uh, what, in your opinion, what is the single most important action an individual can take to kind of play a role in a mutual society? How can they get involved? How do they get their foot in the door and feel yeah. part of it? Yeah, so um, I just have to say, and forgive me, because I am writing this book and it's called Mutualism, Building the Next Economy from the Ground Up. And people can go to buildmutualism.net with a little hyphen in between and start to just learn more and find out. And I, what I, my intention in writing the book was to start gathering people for whom this seems interesting or it resonates or it feels right. It's not, if people don't like it, there's so many other things they should join and be a part of, but I think it's really important for the people who this speaks to their heart and their mind and their gut, let's gather, let's create a community. And I think that's really important. Freelancers Union is already a tremendous part of that. Um, this is such a great reciprocal relationship, but we're starting to see these new models with workers at Google organizing, uh, the taxi cab industry itself, or people are forming co-ops in platforms. They are starting to have the Taxi Cab Ride, uh, Workers Alliance, which has been around for a while and has really um, organized on this model. So we're, we're already seeing it, but now we have to gather and we have to say there's a next role of government. Let's not make this go back to the 1930s manufacturing era. Let's start building the safety net, which brings all workers together, because ultimately that's the goal. If any workers are getting screwed over, we all are screwed over. You know, we, we are as strong as our weakest among us. And if we don't form a coalition together, at our peril. And so I would say one of the things that's the most important is that we really think about that. And this isn't charity. Do not think you are doing something for somebody else first. You think about solidarity for yourself and the people that are connected to you and solidarity broader, but it's solidarity and not charity. And since the late 60s, I think we've forgotten that. We've built up a whole nonprofit sector that's supported by foundations that really are not rooted in communities in that same way. And now it's time we've got to build. We've got to build together. Yeah, I think you're right. We're, and we're, I think we are really in the cusp of that turning point where uh, a lot of organizations are now moving away from depend on depending on bigger corporations or, or bigger uh, uh, you know uh, you know investment groups to to support the work they're doing. They're now turning to the members, asking their members, "How should we move forward? We need to be a part of it. Your voice is so important to to kind of help us shape and mold on what are the things we should be fighting for and how can we support great create a, a stronger social safety net for each other." Yeah, I mean, like, look at freelance isn't free. You know, a lot of times people think, and you know this because you were like the leader in the city council that really made this happen. We came to you because we had spoken with freelancers and other organizations. Freelancers told us this was their worst problem. We, we tried to get it passed in Albany. We convened labor lawyers. We wrote the legislation. So we were the idea lab to get that passed. And because freelancers were a powerful, mobilized group, especially in New York, we were able to then go to our brother and sister unions, the Randy Weingarten, the teachers union, the late Hector Figueroa, and we were able to put together a winning coalition. And as you remember, it passed unanimously with Democrats and Republicans. And so um, th these things, you can't just wait for a foundation to give you money for a good idea. You have to be watching the trends and translating that into actionable policy and on the ground organizing. And it takes years and sometimes it's not strategically charming or, or sexy. It's not the issue du jour. It's just what people need to be able to pay their rent and you know their expenses. And you know that's what I think we're seeing that because of these policies of Ronald Reagan you know, if we've hollowed out the economy, we've really left people who are working class, both on the low wage end of working class and the more formally educated on the professional part of the working class, but it is a working class. And if we don't build in policies that people articulate what they need through their unions and organization and then make it pass, it, it won't happen. 
Definitely. So can you speak more to your book? Uh, I, I had the privilege of, of reading a few chapters. Uh, was, I thought the prologue itself was very insightful and in not only who you are, but why, you know, you've, you've taken on a lot of these battles and, and worked very hard to create these spaces and organizations in which people can come together and, and create mutual society. So uh, are there any really important things, standout points that you think people should look out for when they're, when they're reading through your book? I can't help this, Raphael, but let me just show you. It's such a good looking book, you know? Like, people remember the subway ads, um, you know, you could see. So, um, yeah, I think that, you know, there, there are a few points that I think at this moment, you know, again, to underscore the role of government isn't to not have one, this is not libertarianism, but to have it pivot. And if you look at the social movements in America from the Civil Rights Act to the New Deal itself, it was built on the very essence of these organizations. And so if you look at the African-American community uh, during slavery and after slavery, the there were these benevolent associations where people could bank because they were unbanked. And uh, Professor Nembars, Gordon Nembars from John Jay College wrote a book called Collective Courage, which is a must read, I think, which really shows how there were these connections between the cooperative movement and these kinds of associations and that they started to cultivate their own leaders that passed the baton from generation to generation. And when you look at the Civil Rights Act, you can see that it was built off of these kinds of institutions. My favorite that I wrote about in the book is A. Philip Randolph, who was the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters with A. Philip Randolph, who those who are longtime freelancers union members will remember, is just was a great, wonderful leader. And they not only built the movement within the labor movement and integrated the AFL-CIO, A. Philip Randolph integrated the military, and then they were the architects of the March on Washington. But it really started from the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and these benevolent associations. You can see that with the New Deal. You had these unions like Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union, and they built banks and insurance companies and housing. And that base was the political base that brought the New Deal in coalition with other unions. And so that's why I say, if we don't start building our institutions like the freelancers union and the unions like the writers union and others that are organizing the, the Google workers, um, that's gonna be the base and you have to have institution. And I think that's the most important thing. And then connecting that to the social movements so that there is a fight for equity and equality and fairness uh, but it's sturdy and intergenerational. So uh, just to get back into the politics, and, and you know, we, we would love to hear your, your insight on this, given that you've had your own policy wins as the head of the organization. You know, the big topic right now uh, happening in California and across the country is AB5, uh, the, the question around the ABC test and, and how uh, stringent it is, and it's really been detrimental to the freelance economy. Uh, I myself uh, believe that it's not the best pass forward. Uh, you know, the, the it's created a huge mess in California, the need to create over a hundred exemptions in a hundred different industries. To this day, there's still conversations about other exemptions that need to, that need to be created. You know, it, it worked as like a regressive tax. People now have to forcefully get an LLC in California. It's over $800 a year that they have to file for, uh, file for uh, to, to be able to get it created. Uh, so, you know, we, we are going to work uh, to, to kind of bring everyone together and, and really make it clear to Washington that we do stand behind the PRO Act. We do stand behind all of these workers that are being misclassified, you know, as they were allies of ours when we were fighting for the Freelancers and Free Act in New York City. You know, we're going to be allies with them in their fight uh, to get the justice they need. But at the same time, you know, freelance, the freelance economy is, as we all know, is the future of work. Uh, there are people who are doing this professionally as a choice. They want the independence. They don't want to be bogged down of being tied to uh, uh, an employer. Um, and we're going to work to 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 lobby and make sure that th that this that this is the conversation that's front and center, and that we, at the end of the day, have a voice in the final policies put forward. Any advice on our membership, people out there who are concerned, who are afraid uh, of how they how they should get involved, how they should work together. 
to be able to to uh, you know tackle on these challenges? Well, I, I think the first thing I want to say is, you know, Raphael, you've really um, focused the freelancers union on the membership and what the members need and what is happening. And, you know, I think that your leadership is substantive and that people need to, to know that, um, that, that you're on it. I, I want to talk about it like this. I think that we need to analyze what's happening. The, the working class, truthfully, is being split in two. We've decided that there's a very low wage working class and a kind of more seasoned professional working class. And we don't even think it's in the working class. We say they're rich. And those are our members. There are some that are very low wage and some that are more professional. When we stick together, we win. It's just not more complicated. There's just absolutely no read of history that can say otherwise. And so what we have to do is say, when people want to say, there's no such thing as a real freelancer, that there's um, something sellout about the lifestyle, we have to know that's not true. And I think that's one of the most important things is to start to, to own your life. I, I would say the thing I learned from freelancers um, that changed my life was this idea of leading a freelance 360 life and saying, I'm going to put my life together in the way that is meaningful to me. I want to be there for my family, their needs, or because I want to be there. I want to walk my dog. I want to care about my food. There's more to life than just working. And freelancers have defined that. And that really is the next era where we start to say, this isn't just about a grow, grow, grow capitalist economic model. We say we're human beings and we need to be treated in a certain way. Freelancers lead on that. So let's celebrate that. Let's teach that to the rest of the economy. And when there are elected officials who are two dimensional and can't see that, we have to say, I'm so sorry you don't understand. You are hurting all workers when you hurt us. And I feel like there's something about this that we have to culturally own our strength and own our power and start to tell people they should be ashamed when they try to make it so that freelancers are, are not heard in this debate. But I do want to say that there are tremendous allies. I know that Senator Schumer is going to be here and there are political leaders um, and Raphael has really done a wonderful job here who are like, we are not going down that road. We are in this together. And that's where I do have confidence because when we own our power, we can find other people's power and we can join in coalition and that's what I know Raphael is doing. And that is the only way that it's going to be. And I'm confident that we will get there. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, we've been having a lot of productive conversations uh, here in New York. You know, that New York itself is uh, visiting the topic. Uh, and we've made it clear to legislators here that, you know, we have to ensure that any, any sort of bill that moves forward to address misclassification uh, takes into account that all workers are, are not, do not work in, in the same uh, structure. And, and we have to make sure that no one at the end of the day is, is hurt by this. You know, uh, Raphael, sorry to interrupt, like there's a freelancer politics and it's mutualism. And that's why I wrote this book because it's about updating the institutions. We've had unions since there've been medieval guilds, since there are craft unions and industrial unions, it is going to evolve. Freelancers are defining this and there's a politics. And that's why I, I wrote this book. And I think that we need to start to have a consciousness around what is that politics and a strategy for building the coalition that wins. And um, I think we're gonna have very strange politics. We already do, um, stranger than one could even have believed. Um, but I do believe and forgive this, but we have to start getting back to being about love and kindness and building. And we have to move away from being a critiquing culture. It is just too easy to open your computer and go like this and say something mean, like enough. It's really, when you go like this and you write it, let's respond and say, well, what are you doing? What are you doing to make the world better? Are you volunteering for mutual aid to help somebody get their medicine? 
Are you helping to organize? If there's a picket line in your community, did you go and walk the picket line? Did you go to the supermarket and buy Cabot cheese? Did you go to REI? Do you, I'm not a sports person, I only care about it, <laughs> but you know, like the Green Bay Packers because they're a co-op type community organization. But don't, enough, we need to be intolerant of each other when all we do is critique. Not enough, we have to build. Thank, thank you, Sarah, for those for those uh, wise words. Uh, and I just really want to reiterate to you know, our membership. Uh, this is an issue we're taking on very seriously. Uh, I know that I, I haven't been publicly speaking on it on social media only because I've been doing a lot of behind the scenes work of myself catching up on the issue, uh, but also making sure that I have you know all of the information needed to put forward a strong argument on why this is why this shouldn't. Oops, sorry about that. Why this shouldn't be a uh, this is detrimental to the freelance economy to the freelance worker themselves. And if we're really trying to build an economy that uh you know creates a, a, a fair uh, space for for everyone, uh, that freelancers' voice have to be taken into account moving forward. So you everyone will be hearing more uh, uh, from me uh, on the issue uh, as it, as it progresses. Uh, Sarah, any any closing thoughts or uh, on the book? First, I want to say that I'm looking forward to receiving a hard copy. It's a, it has a beautiful cover, uh, uh, beautiful art, and also uh, I want members to know that we're gonna be able to uh, we're gonna have it available to our members at, at some point. Uh, so please keep an eye out on that. We want to make sure that you all have a copy. Uh, so please uh, keep checking our websites, check our social media when that time will come. And I would love it if people come to build mutualism.net and sign up so that we can start to keep the conversation going and we'll be working hand in glove with the freelancers union as we go forward and um it's just been great being with you all here thank you sarah so we are waiting for a center a majority leader schumer to join us it should be on any minute now. So we're going to take a break literally for maybe two or three minutes, uh, give them time to be able to sign on. Uh, and then we'll continue the conversation from there. So thank you all for joining. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, and please feel free to please, please feel stay on so you can uh, uh, introduce or kind of say hello to the Senator and, and express your, your thoughts on, on some of these issues as well. Okay, great.
Hello. I do believe that uh, Senator Schumer should be joining us any second now. Can you, Sarah? Ryan? Welcome back. Hey, Senator. Hi. Majority leader, I should say. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. We got there. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, it's good to see you. Uh, you. I have. I have Sarah Horowitz with us. She's the founder of Freelancers Union. You might know her from your work in the past. She wanted I to did. join. She, I say she wanted to... Hi, Senator. Nice to see you. Glad you're doing well after the craziness. So. Oh, lots of craziness. But now, as John Lewis said, we have good trouble. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, we had it. Sorry. There you go. We, we had a great conversation on mutualism. The idea of us working together, building our social safety net, helping one another, uh, and uh, we thought it would be a great way to talk about all the great work that uh, that you you have on your agenda, Senator. Uh, how you've been able to help freelancers over the past few months through this pandemic, and it. how we can continue working together. How many people are on the line? Well, we we had over five hundred RSVPs, so I expect that to be the number. And you will send this out to everybody, all twenty thousand members. Yes, they all they're all going to watch. Yeah, and and hear from you. Good. Uh, Good. What okay. we should be doing. So, Sarah. Yeah. Sarah, I, I just wanted to say hello because uh, we've seen each other many a time in the past, and to thank you and uh, you know wish you wish you well in getting the right votes that we all need and. Um, and I think just the idea of mutualism that goes back to amalgamated clothing workers, building banks and insurance companies. And I know that you got that from the beginning and Raphael has been a great leader. So let me just say, have a good talk and nice to see you and take Likewise. care. And any way I can help the freelancers, I'm going to do it. I love you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Senator. So be before you begin again, I just want to thank you and your office from day one of the pandemic uh, hitting the city of New York and, and cities across the country. You know, the first phone call I got was from your office about how you can help, what can you do? And we talked about the need for unemployment insurance being expanded to the independent workforce. We were able to get that done through PUA. We saw programs like the PPP program being instituted, including the independent worker. Uh, and that was, you know, very, that was a very important lifeline. And it's, it's really played a, a big role in getting people on their feet. Uh, and survive. But we know this, this has been stretching out now for, it's going to be a year now and, and people are still suffering. They're going through a tough time and we count on your leadership to continue, uh, you know, keeping freelancers in, in mind and making sure they have the relief. Well, they need. I called you that first day and I pushed mm -hmm. real hard. I had to explain a lot to a lot of people, but thank God uh, the freelancers are included in so many of these programs and I'll keep fighting for you all the way. Thank you, Senator. So you like to give us an update on, on what you've been working on these yes. past few weeks? Okay, yeah. Let me talk for a few minutes, and then we'll do some questions, if that's okay with you. But Absolutely. first, I want to thank you, Raphael. I knew you when you were an elected official. When you left to go to the freelancers, I said, oh, my, I wish he were still staying in office. But you have done <laughs> such an amazing job for such an important component of our workforce, freelancers, that now I'm very glad that you are there. And you've done an amazing job. We've been a great team. and. Uh, I know what you what it's like. I grew up in a union household, so I know firsthand how important unions are um, in terms of the rights and dignity of their members. It's uh, my grandpa was one of the founders of the paper workers union. He worked in the uh, paper mills up in Utica, New York, and uh, so many of my family have benefited from being union members. And so when the freelancers union came together, I thought that was a great thing. And I want to thank you day in, day out for doing everything you do to protect freelancers and independent contractors. Give everybody a seat at the table. Every one of you has jobs. Many of you have families and other responsibilities in your lives. And yet all of you on this call have taken that extra step to help the freelancers union get stronger and stronger and stronger. And that gives me hope. The fact that so many people are willing to take that extra step to make our country a more equitable and a fairer and a more decent place. Uh, wow, you're great. So let me first give you, I uh, tell you a little bit about uh, what's happened to me. Um, uh, January 6th, just a vignette on January 6th. I guess I would call that uh, like in the Charles Dickens novel, A Tale of Two Cities. I think the first sentence was, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. For me, January 6th was just that. Um, January 5th was our election in Georgia. We knew that we had to win those two Senate seats to get back the Senate. 
which we had been not been in charge of for all too long, six long, horrible years, uh, where McConnell just did nothing to help working people, to help average folks. Um, as Tuesday night bled into Wednesday morning, I was still up. They hadn't declared winners. I was clicking on my computer to look at the results every 30 seconds, watching the TV. Finally, at 4 a.m., it was declared that Warnock and Ossoff had won. I knew both of them. In fact, I recruited Warnock. I tried to get Stacey Abrams to run. She said no, but there's someone as good as me, Raphael Warnock, and wait till you see him. He's going to be a star, first African-American from Georgia, elected at a born when there were two staunch segregationists representing Georgia. Anyway, so at 4 a.m., I feel great for a moment, real joy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be the party mm -hmm. later. We fought so long and hard to make this happen. That was my first emotion, and it's still with me. But there was a second emotion that occurred soon thereafter. And I said, this job is awesome, but not awesome in the way my teenage daughters would use it. Gee, Dad, that's awesome. But more in the biblical sense. The Bible, in the Bible, when the angels see the face of God, they tremble in awe. And I was awestruck about the importance of this job. How many people depended on our democratic majority to get things done. That it would not be easy with only 50 votes, but that we had to do it. And the tremendous responsibility that's on uh, these shoulders and the shoulders of my colleagues uh, struck me. And so the job uh, was, uh, I looked at the job as an awesome responsibility in the sense of how major and important it was. So with those two emotions, I went to bed about 4.30, got in the car at 7, drive down to D.C. I'm on the Senate floor at 1 uh, p.m., I'm only the putative majority leader on the floor for about a half hour. I hadn't even given a maiden speech. When a police officer in a bulletproof vest with a submachine gun strapped across his waist grabs me firmly, not harshly, but firmly by the collar and says, Senator, get out of here. You're in trouble. You're in wow. danger. I was only 30 feet from these sons of guns. These, oh, they just, I could use a lot of curse words, but I hear this is being streamed, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody, but they are the most despicable, racist, selfish, obnoxious people that I've ever, ever seen. And um, we're going to make sure, by the way, that every one of them is prosecuted it, to the fullest extent of the law. I've spoken to the Attorney General-elect Merrick Garland, told him the Congress will give him all the resources he needs to do that, both because they deserve to go to jail and we want to make sure anyone else who thinks of this knows they're going to be sitting in prison for a long time. Of course, the head of it was Donald Trump, and um, it wouldn't have happened without him. He encouraged them. He told them to come to Washington. He told them to march on the Capitol. In hardly veiled language, he encouraged them to use violence. And so I'm glad the House impeached him. We're going to have an impeachment trial next week. Uh, it'll be strong. The American people will see what Donald Trump and these rioters did firsthand for those who haven't seen it and those who have will see it again. Um, and so uh, I'm glad he's being tried. I will work as hard as I can to try and get my Republican colleagues to convict. It's an uphill fight, but history will judge them if they vote to acquit uh, the action, probably the worst action of any president in the history of the country. Um, so now, the next few weeks, we have three things we have to do. The first is impeachment trial. The second is filling the ca president's cabinet where Republicans try to block us. They can't block us, but they can slow it down. And the third is getting COVID relief, which is what we are really here to talk about today. Um, as you know, from the day this crisis started, I felt the federal government had to step up in a big way. I negotiated the CARES Act um, with Mnuchin that's where we first got some funding for you, the freelancers. That was mm -hmm. the phone call that Raphael noted the first day of the bill. I called up Raphael and said, I want to help them get freelancers and part-timers and gig workers and everybody else included in the, uh, in the bill. And uh, in that first bill, we did a whole lot of good. Here was the problem. Everyone thought at that point that COVID would be gone by the summer. So the bill had a, mm -hmm. uh, it had a shelf life. Um, it wasn't gone by the summer, and we wanted to act that summer. Uh, Speaker Pelosi and I put together something that was big and bold called the HEROES Act. Um, Mitch McConnell and the Republicans said no. First, he said, let's have a pause while people are suffering. People are 
losing their jobs. They're not able to pay the rent. They're not able to feed their families. Let's have a pause, he says. And then um, they said, let's study it. Finally, in December, we did get some COVID relief. Um, and it was only because unemployment insurance was running out as of uh, the day after Christmas. 12 million people would have sunk right into poverty, unable to I mean, they had no money, unemployed people. Mm -hmm. Some of them are on this line, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no money to pay the rent, no money to feed the, the family or do anything else. So we did get that bill done. It has some good things in it. Um, it has the $600 checks. Uh, we're fighting in the new bill, I'll get to that in a minute, to raise that to $2,000, a total of $2,000. We were able for the first time um, to, uh, um, get uh, ITIN families, um, st mixed status immigrant families to receive the benefit. As you saw, there was a move to take it away from them in the bill we did uh, two days ago, but I managed to beat that back. We, of course, important to you, extended the unemployment benefit for, uh, for $300, the extra $300 a week. Originally, it was 600. That's what I wanted. The Republicans wanted none. So 300 is where we ended up. That's extra on top of, of course, state unemployment. But we maintain the eligibility and I made sure this happened for gig workers, freelancers, self-employed and other non-traditional employment arrangements that I had fought. And really, I'll pat myself on the back, I guess, a little single <laughs> really got into the CARES Act. No one was paying attention to what you needed. And New York, mm -hmm. we're in New York, and it's good you have Espinal. And folks, if you didn't have the union, I don't think it would have happened. So the union is very important, and you should encourage everybody to join it. Anyway, we, did a, few, we did a few other good things in there. We lifted the ban on Pell Grant ineligibility for the incarcerated. There are a lot of people in prison. They want to make a better life for themselves. They can't. They have no money, so they can't pay a college tuition. Now they'll get a Pell Grant. We got $25 billion in that bill for rent relief. Um, an extension of the eviction moratorium. Um, 1.3 billion goes to New York and it can only be used for rent relief. So I'm sure, Raphael, you'll get the union to make sure it's done, used in the right way. And um, this was the first ever federal emergency rental assistance program. We fought hard for that. We got a 4% floor in the low income housing tax credit that helps build more housing for low income people of desperate need in New York. We got money, 13, to feed the hungry, 2 billion. Listen to this. Uh, one of the saddest things you watch during this COVID crisis is grandchildren and children saying goodbye to their parents and grandparents on Zoom. They're dying. They're in a hospital. Mm -hmm. But of course, with COVID, they can't go there. It breaks your heart. But then I learned of an additional indignity, which was that they couldn't, these people had no money, many of them, for a, a decent funeral and a decent burial. Uh, Trump could have done this on his own under FEMA. He didn't. And so we put it in the legislation. And now there's going to be $2 billion to reimburse low-income families for their funeral costs. We got the money for the MTA, the $4 billion they needed. Again, I had to push very hard for that. Um, uh, so they don't cut back on service, buses, or trains. We got $10 billion for child care, $7 billion for broadband. And probably the most important, two most important things, 69 billion to distribute vaccines to the states. Every vaccine is now free. We put enough money in that mm -hmm. December bill that everyone gets a free vaccine. Don't let your insurance company try to get a co-payment or a, say there's a uh, deductible or whatever else. It's free for everyone. Um, and uh, we wanna make sure that communities of color and poorer communities get the vaccine in the same way everyone else, not put at the bottom of the list. And we got in this bill $88 billion for K through 12 public schools so they could open safely uh, for a higher education. And of course, we extended the PPP program, $325 billion in small business and nonprofit relief. That's in the law, including $284 billion for PPP first loans and a second loan option. Um, also a set aside for CDFIs and MDIs. These are community development financial. They help small little businesses who want to apply for PPP. You have the union, they help you, I'm sure. But a lot of small businesses don't know how to apply and they don't have the wherewithal. They mm -hmm. don't have 
the this community development financial institutions and minority development institutions got 15 billion dollars so they could help everyone apply for the ppp and it didn't go to the big boys did you want to say something rafael no i just want to say that was a big issue at one point uh, we a lot of our members uh, didn't couldn't find the proper bank to be able to apply for the loan uh, and I know at, so, at one point you did increase funding to ensure that there was some education on the ground. So it's great to hear that there's more funding coming. Yes, more support. I will send you a list of these CDFIs and MDIs and anyone in your union can call them up and they will help you apply if you're having trouble with it. Okay. Um, we also got our Save Our Stages uh, done. Some Many of our freelancers mm -hmm. and workers are in the arts one way or another. And our independent venues, our movie theaters, Broadway, other, all the live entertainment spaces probably suffered even more than restaurants. They were the first to close and they'll be the last to open. So we worked very hard to get the money for these institutions, $15 billion in the December bill. Um, and we included our museums and cultural institutions. They employ tons of people and they're vital to the whole industry of New York. People come to New York for these museums and for Broadway. Uh, a lot of my Republican colleagues said, we don't want to give any money to those. They're New York. They're rich. They're not rich. They're out of it. They're, they're, they are. They have money, but they don't have any money coming in and they're laying off people and closing and not attracting people to New York, et cetera. So we got those as well. So it was a very, uh, it was a good bill. Could have been better. Should have been bigger. Republicans and Trump were in charge. It was good. Now, what about the future? Well, we are now doing another bill. And as you know, I was up till 6 a.m. in the morning, all of us in the Senate, uh, passing the Joe Biden's America, American Relief Plan, ARP. Um, it's a funny name. I don't like to call it ARP. That sounds weird, you know. <laughs> um, and I remember being little and reading The World of GARP. Remember that book? And so yep. anyway, no ARP, ARP. Um, so we still need a load of help. You saw the unemployment. Mm -hmm. You see people still losing their jobs, business still closing, mortgage deferrals increasing, schools closed in so many states, restaurants, bars, travel, tourism, all in crisis. And this idea that we don't have to do anything is ridiculous, just ridiculous. And so given the weak state of the economy, we need big, bold action. Our Republican friends, half of them want to do nothing, and the other half want to do so little. We made a big mistake, for those of you who followed politics, in 2009, Obama was president. They said, let's negotiate with the Republicans. They put so little in that the recession lasted for five years. And they took a year to negotiate the other thing, the ACA, a good thing, but stretched out. So Joe Biden, urged by me and Nancy, said, hey, we want to work with you Republicans, but if you're not going to work with us, we're not going to cut the thing in half or a quarter, and we're not going to hold it up. So we had to pass the bill uh, Thursday, not Friday a.m., Friday 5 a.m., uh, with just Democratic votes, but it's $1.9 billion. It's beefed up stimulus payments. It goes to the 2000. And how that works is most of you have gotten checks for 600. Now you'll get an additional check if, God willing, this passes, I think it will, at $1,400 per person. So a family of one gets 14, a family of two gets 28 in addition to the 600. Okay. Um, uh, in this bill is more money for rental assistance, more money for child care, and for the first time, $350 billion for state and local relief, giving money to our state and our city. Um, they need money. The Republicans wouldn't give any money. They're helping the blue states. It's utter mm -hmm. bullshit. Um, it helps mm -hmm. all kinds of states. But these guys, the Republicans in the Senate, you know, a majority of Republicans are for the president's bill. But the Republicans in the Senate are so enthralled by the hard right wing that um, they don't want to put any money because these very rich people don't want to pay any taxes. So they say, do no money. But Nancy and I insisted we get a big amount for, for direct state and local aid. They fund a lot of organizations that many of your folks work for. So they need the money. And we're dividing it. Um, a little more than half goes to the state. And then a little less than half, about 40%, 45 goes directly to New York City, to the counties, to the towns, the villages. We also got some more money uh, for small business assistance, 20 billion more for public transit to keep the subways and buses and running, increase of 160 billion for education so the schools can open. The goal is to have every school open in September and many schools, New York City schools are open now uh, as well. Okay, 
So that is what is in the, well, let me go over if I'm leaving anything out. There's money for rental and mortgage assistance. If you own a home or a co-op or a condo and you're having trouble paying the mortgage, there is now money for that. There wasn't in the past. It was just for rental. As I said, there is money. Oh, and there is a huge amount of money for vaccines. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a minute separately because mm -hmm. we all know the vaccines are important. But we also got money for restaurants, the $25 billion Restaurant Act. Our restaurants can get the PPP, and they got it the first time, they can get it again, but they're hurting more than other industries, and they need something like the Save Our Stages that I was able to pass um, uh, with the help of some of my colleagues. Amy Klobuchar did a very good job on this, and John Cornyn, a Republican, helped us with Save Our Stages, so it was mm -hmm. somewhat bipartisan. But in any case, um, uh, they, we need something like that for the restaurants. So we have, and I've worked with Tom Colicchio and the, and the, you know, they, there's a whole New York group of restaurants that are like the freelancers. They're not a union, but they're really good. They're strong. They're hard. They work hard. And we'll get money so the restaurants like the stages, like Broadway, like the museums and others can get a six-month grant. We also expanded PP eligibility, PPP for nonprofits like the YMCA's or Habitat of Humanity, things like that, Goodwills. Um, we got a little more money for the EDA for tourism and travel set aside and more money for Save Our Stages. But before I move for the Q&A, there are a couple of things that are important to you, so I wanted to highlight them. First is the enhanced unemployment insurance. One of the most important elements of the CARES Act was the unemployment insurance, which I would like to see made permanent. Mm -hmm. That's a goal and dream of mine. You know, COVID revealed, friends, so many problems with our society. For instance, it showed what bad health care so many people of color, particularly poor people of color, got. They, you, you know, COVID was the magnifying glass. Oh, everyone's saying, wow, many more black and brown people got, got COVID, many more died. Well, why? Because they got lousy, lousy health care. If you're an affluent person in a suburb and you have a pre-existing condition, say diabetes, it's taken care of. You live in the inner city, no one gives a hoot. Anyway, similarly, we saw how unemployment should be made permanent and the expansion that we got in COVID for gig workers, for freelancers, for independent contractors. We'd like that to stay, but we expanded the benefits, as you know, um, for two, to, to more than two million more people um, in these non-traditional uh, proposals through Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. We also increased in the first bill um, $600 benefit as you know, um, now they, the, um, we, the Biden administration have proposed doing that for four, um, for, to four hundred dollars. Um, so we want to extend it. Here's what else is in the new package. Um, uh, th that th this is part of the law passed, and they jumbled it up here a little bit. But these things we got into the bill, and we'll keep them in the new bill. We expand eligibility for self-employed and gig workers and increase the number of weeks the benefits a worker can claim from 39 to 50. We reinstated the bump, as I said, for $300 in the new bill. We're trying to get to 400. This is very important to many of you. We created a new mixed earner benefit for workers uh, who earned a combination of traditional wage, W-2s, and self-employment, 1099. And you were seeing lower benefits Specifically, what we did is we created an additional federally funded $100 of a benefit per week for these workers who made at least $5,000 a year in the self-employment income to supplement the lower benefit amount. This is particularly, I know how bad this has been to mixed earners in New York, particularly in the arts and entertainment industry. So this is now in the bill. So this will help you. And again, I thank Raphael and the gig workers uh, and the uh, freelancers um, as, and everybody else for helping make that happen. Now, one of my, one we're trying to do in the next package is expend all of this. It ends in March from the December bill. We're going to get it going till September and God willing by then COVID will be wrestled with. So I'm going to talk about that in a minute when I talk about uh, the vaccines, but I have two more things I want to tell you about. One, I need your help, Raphael and the union, mm -hmm. to get behind something that Elizabeth Warren and I are pushing, along with Ayanna Presley from Massachusetts and our three new Congress members from New York, 
Jamal Bowman, Richie Torres, and Mondaire Jones. And that is that the president, on his own, can sign a, um, uh, an executive order and eliminate $50,000 of student debt. Lots of the members of your union have the burden of student debt. It's been, it's just too great a burden. And the effing federal government is charging them 7% on a federal mm -hmm. loan or a federally backed loan. When then you go to buy a car or a house, you'd get 4 or 5%. So we know, we believe the president, Biden, has the authority to sign a statement that 50,000 of debt is gone. This is really important to so many of you. And we're trying to get 10 million emails, emails, letters, calls, however you want to communicate with the White House and tell the president to do this. Elizabeth Warren and I met with the president. For a, He was very gracious, 45 minutes. We're trying to persuade him. He's open-minded. He knows we're making a big pitch for this. And let me just say something else. It particularly will help. We all care. I know your union does, a progressive union like yours, about the wealth gap between black mm -hmm. and white, 40% of the wealth gap between black, brown, and white people, between black and brown versus you know white, is caused by student debt. After 20 years, only 6% of whites have student debt left and 95% of black and brown people, mainly because they've got loaded up, so many of them, by these for-profit colleges and other junky institutions that were fraudulent, they were taken advantage of, they didn't have a degree. By the way, Trump and DeVos pushed these horrible institutions that are bloodsuckers. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, uh, and they can't get a great job because you don't have a degree and you have all this debt. Anyway, please, Raphael, I will send you a little sheet on that in addition to what we're sending on the obvious unemployment benefits and other things for the freelancers and try to encourage people to call right the White House and just tell them the Schumer-Warren bill. There are some that propose 10,000 or 5,000. No, our bill is 50,000, okay? Well, you can that would be life-changing. Life yeah, life-changing. So mm -hmm. please help us. On the Save Our Stages, which as you know, I, Iris, could you bring me my briefcase? I'm gonna show you what I wear, wore um, mm -hmm. the day of the inauguration. Maybe some of you saw it. Um, <laughs> It's my little Save Our Stages mask. Here, can you see it? I just wore it today when I walked in, in Prospect Park by my house, yeah, I'm yeah. back home. See? Lo so I love it. I love it. Yeah, we should take a picture of that, you and yeah, me. But yeah. anyway. As, 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 you, as, you, as you know, know over 90% of, of our members who are in the performing fields are, are out of work completely. There you go. And uh, seeing your support, it's really important. So Save Our Stages will give a big grant to all of them, the little and the big, Broadway and a little, you know, music house, a little uh, bar that does uh, entertainment and is a, a performance venue. The art, it also will even go to some of the uh, independent movie theaters so they don't close. Because all of these places depend on people gathering together, they're the first to close, last to open. So we did that and we're using that to help the restaurants as a model. And I'm going to keep fighting to keep this program going as long as we have this um, uh, problem, as long as we have this COVID problem. Um, it's, it's such a beautiful part of New York. People come from all over the country and all over the world to live in New York for the arts. And they're not all on Broadway. They're going to these live venues and performing and you know, Jerry Seinfeld's helping us because he got his start in one of these venues. And so um, uh, please write or call or tweet. Well, you can't tweet, but email the president uh, and make sure that he knows you're for this. OK, so we can get this going. We can keep this going. OK. And um, we're also trying to fight, get more money for the National Endowment of the Arts, the National Endowment of Humanities. The arts are. Here's what I tell my colleagues. And this is not just true in New York City. This is true throughout the country. The arts are an economic engine. It's estimated that 7% of Albany's economies, 5% of Syracuse's economy is on the arts. That's a huge chunk. And so we got to make sure people understand the arts. Not only do they add something special, they're the extra you know, yeast in our lives, but um, they're an economic engine. 
So we have to keep doing it, and we're going to fight for that. Finally, on vaccines, I think that's the last thing I'm going to talk about, and then I'll open it up to questions. So as I mentioned, vaccines are now free, and we gave money to the states to help distribute them, but it's not working out that well. So Joe Biden, in this new bill that we just passed, proposed $160 billion for the federal government to set up centers across the country making sure that minority communities are not at the bottom of the list, but get treated fairly and well. And the federal government will bring the vaccines there. They're increasing. They're going to use the Defense Production Act, I hope, which allows them to take over factories to up the production of vaccines. But they need to distribute them. And they're going to use FEMA workers, Federal Emergency Management Assistance, they're going to use National Guard, and they're employing 100,000 temporarily healthcare workers, you know, trained healthcare workers, and they're going to minister. You may have seen on the news yesterday, Yankee Stadium is going to be a federal site mm -hmm. for the vaccines. But there'll be lots of sites in Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx and Manhattan, Staten Island and all over, and it should make it a lot easier. And they're going to have fewer requirements. You know, these requirements make it, you wait online for three hours or six hours, and they say, oh, no, you're not, you're not. You know, you're not in the requirements. They've been very confusing. So we want to do that. Biden says he believes that by September, so many people will have been vaccinated that we'll be back to pretty much normal. My view, they haven't said this to me, so I'm just giving you my own judgment here. I could be wrong. But my view is they're lowballing it. I think we can have this done by June or July and get things going again. Vaccines are vital. Trump administration screwed these things up to a fairly well, um, not so much in the production, although even there they let them sell the vaccines to overseas and they let them, uh, uh, they didn't do enough. I, I had to get them to go from 2 billion to 9 billion to help the companies make the vaccines quicker. But um, uh, they didn't know how to distribute them at all. This is the most incompetent administration I think we've ever, ever had. You know, they use racism, bigotry, divisiveness, and infantile ego, that's what Trump was, as a substitute for getting something done for people, and it frustrates everybody. Biden's going to do this, make it a high priority. That's one of the main reasons with that, and the state and local aid, and the unemployment insurance, and all the things I mentioned why we have to pass this bill. I may have to do it without Republicans. That's not an easy job. I got some very, you know, moderate, conservative, careful Democrats in my caucus, but so far so good. We got all 50 of them to vote for the first step Tuesday. So finally, in conclusion, um, uh, I'm an optimist. We witnessed one of the lowest points on January 6th, but on January 20th, Biden took over. I became majority leader. I'm the first New Yorker to be a majority leader. My father was an exterminator. We never were raised with any money. And uh, I'm, um, I'm the majority leader. So that, you know, it's, as I said, it's, it gives me joy, but a feeling of, of awe, humble, humbleness. But I am going to fight for you every day. I believe that the government has an obligation to help average folks, poor people, and people in the middle class trying, struggling to stay there. So I will be by your side. I think the freelancers union is one of the great things that's happened in New York in the last few years as a union guy. I think it's great. And the relationship between us, Raphael, you, me, mm -hmm. and the freelancers will stay like this for as long as I'm around. Well, we appreciate, well, we appreciate it, Senator. It, Senator. And congrats, congrats again. again. As, as, as you like to say, say, you earned you it earned the, the old-fashioned old way. way. That's true. <laughs> it took a while. And we did, this wasn't the route we thought we'd get there, but here we are. Here we are. Right. So, so we do have some questions from our members that, that have come in. Uh, some of them hit on some points you brought up, but I just want to you know, reiterate, reiterate the importance of them. And then there's one uh, bigger issue that I'll touch on as well. But first and foremost, we thank you again for including the hybrid workers in, in the previous package, you know, ensure that those folks who were earning through traditional W-2s and also earning through independent work, 1099s, their whole income was being uh, being taken into consideration when they received their, P their PUA unemployment insurance at the end of the day. I, it, it wasn't perfect, but at least they're getting that extra $100 a week, uh, which means $400 a month they didn't have before. Uh, so that we're, I think there's still hope that we can continue this conversation and see that at the end of the day, 
that their whole income is taken into consideration yes. and they're being treated uh, the same in the system as a that, traditional worker. That would be my goal, Raphael. The but we're, we're, we're the Republicans were in charge. Yeah, we, appre we appreciate that and look forward to continuing those conversations. They had some of it, you know, they had too much say. That, let's put it that way. Right. Um, uh, and then that there's this uh, issue again with those same folks who are receiving the $100 uh, because because uh, the program wasn't instilled until December. There are a lot of folks who were in the PUA system in June, July, August that lost out on a huge chunk of, of funding. So we would love to continue talking about the need to retro get them, get those folks retroactive payments of a hundred those hundred dollars. John, Looking let me back. ask, you know, let me my staff, I am blessed. The reason I'm able to get some things done is I have such a hardworking, smart, dedicated, uh, committed staff. And John Cardinal, as you know, Raphael, did an amazing job here. It wouldn't have happened without you, it wouldn't happen without me, but it wouldn't happen without John Cardinal. John, mm -hmm. would you comment? Are you on the phone? Are you on the Zoom? I think he is. John? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if he's able to uh, jump into oh, call. All right. Well, it's something we'd like to do, Raphael. I wanted to ask him what the progress mm -hmm. was in that regard, but I'll let you know. Okay, okay great. And there's the same, on the same point on relief, you know, folks are struggling, as you know, they're hoping that, the, you know, we, we'll, they'll see uh, more dollars in, in their PUA at the end of the day. Uh, you know, the, the, the small amount they're receiving now just isn't enough for them to get by. Uh, especially through the next few months. So we're hoping we can talk about expanding those payments. Uh, again, looking back retroactively uh, for those folks who have missed out uh, to ensure they have every dollar they need to be able to put food on the table, pay their rent and get by. Right, definitely. We will try to do that. So uh, big issue, uh, big issue for freelancers. Uh, it's, it's played out in California last year and it was the introduction of an ABC test uh, to classify workers as either employees or independent contractors, uh, which which is proven to be very uh, strict and stringent to a point where freelancers across California have lost pretty much all of their work. Uh, and the only way that they're able to to comply with the law is if they apply for an LLC, which in California costs a thousand dollars a year, which is a, to them it's a regressive tax, sure. a new a new a new payment they have to make now. Um, and also employers are afraid to hire them as clients because, because they don't quite understand the law yet. And it right. really came at a bad time with the pandemic as well hitting that now they have to comply with this new law, the pandemic's come in, work has dried up and has really dec decimated any opportunities for freelancers in California. You know, in, in, uh, in DC, the PRO Act, uh, while it's a huge bill and there's a lot of great things in there for, for, for unions, which we support, the ABC test is continues to be problematic only because uh, one, well, the biggest issue is that it has not taken into account all of the amendments that they had to make in California to fix it. Uh, but two, just overall, the, the test has been detrimental to the freelance economy. So it's important that, you know, we have a voice on shaping what that looks like uh, moving forward so that freelancers don't, don't go through the same problems that they did in California. Yeah, look, the PRO Act in general is something I'm supportive of. I believe the more unions we have in America, the better America will be. I believe one of the reasons the middle class has not had a good run for the last 10 or 15 years is the bosses have managed to both destroy some unions and not let unions grow. But uh, the freelancers, as we learned, even with the unemployment insurance, you're in a new and unusual situation. Not one size should fit all. And I'll be happy, PRO Act won't come up for a few months. But I'd be happy to work with you to make sure that freelancers are taken into account in the PRO Act and not make the same mistakes uh, that were made in California. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Super important issue. And I look forward to continuing those conversations with your office, Senator. Great. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Wait, one more thing, to... Rafael. Yeah. Another plan I have is to make PUA permanent. Senator right. Wyden and I, this would be a great thing because there's unemployment among freelancers, even pre-COVID and will be post-COVID. So if we can make a serious longer, you know, as I said, the COVID has let us see the problems in American society. And one of them is dealing with unemployed people so they can never get out of the rut once they're in it. And so we want to make long-term reforms to the unemployment insurance system um, uh, like PUA. Wyden and I have introduced uh, two different proposals 
um, that both give enhanced unemployment benefits with stabilizers. So like say if unemployment, and I don't remember the exact numbers here, but let's say it's above 8%, um, uh, then we would get $600 additional. If it's 6%, maybe $600. You know what I mean? The higher the unemployment means, the harder it is to get a job, the more we should give assistance, uh, extra assistance for people on unemployment. And I'll send you copies of that. I don't know if you're familiar with them uh, in the Freelancers Union, but I'd be interested in your suggestions because it's something down the road that we'd like to do. Absolutely. That'd be a game changer as well. And, and broadening the social safety net for independent workers. Right. Uh, you know, at, at the height of the pandemic, 12 million folks signed up for PUA. This is show yeah. like the impact awesome. that it's had. Yeah. Um, what one more issue, and it's just healthcare. You know, freelancers have to buy their own healthcare through the marketplace, uh, and there's really a need for subsidies uh, for creating a system that's truly affordable uh, to those folks in that marketplace. So we'd love to have those conversations of right. what that can look it's like. We have to make healthcare more affordable and more universal. Definitely appreciate it, Senator. Right. Okay. Well, well thank. You. We'll talk soon, and we'll talk often. I'm sure. Well, thank you, Raphael. Thank you, all the people listening who took time on a beautiful Saturday. I took a walk in Prospect Park in Brooklyn, which is near my house. It's a nice day. Get out there. It's supposed to be junky tomorrow. I don't want to be a weatherman here. <laughs> Although, the weatherman, this again, my day, Bob Dylan, who had a great influence. You don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. We know which way the wind's blowing. We're going to keep fighting for working people, for freelancers and make our country a more equitable place. And I look forward uh, in that battle uh, for us to have some more great victories. Thank you, Rafi. Of course, before you go, my members are, are commenting. They say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, extending PUA will be life-changing. They really appreciate your work and they congratulate you as well. Thanks everybody. Stay safe. Bye, Senator. Bye-bye.